Thank you, Mark, for this kind introduction. Um, it's my third conference with the ICD, and always it's a great experience of enrichment, of knowledge, of friendship. So I will thank, first of all, the ICD for this kind invitation, Mark Domfried, uh, Rosie Vilnius, and the staff. Uh, I would also thank uh, Sir Robin Marsh to host here uh, at UPF uh, this so interesting conference, and uh, Mrs. Margaret to make me more comfortable uh, day by day. Now, I uh, should propose a reflection about uh, cultural heritage in the Commonwealth. Um, I have to say what I present here are the results of a period of research I'm sharing with the students of the master program uh, we share at the University of Siena with the ICD. Uh, so I will not propose an exhaustive analysis, it's impossible, but just some elements of reflection, some uh, elements and points of remarks about this uh, not easy matter to approach. Cultural heritage of Commonwealth. Not easy for at least four reasons, in my opinion. The first one, uh, let's consider what is the Commonwealth. Commonwealth uh, is today still uh, with changes. His Excellency, the Ambassador of Cyprus, mentioned yesterday, one of the most important and interesting institutions in the world. Um, under the direction of a general secretary, tracing back its legitimacy and the elements of its ideological and cultural strength uh, to uh, the sovereignty of Her Majesty the Queen of Britain, and uh, an association of independent, equally sovereign states uh, containing 53 country, member countries at the moment, with different origins, with different uh, cultural uh, influences and traditions. So a huge family, quite difficult to organize. Uh, there is a second element which makes difficult to approach the study of the matter of a cultural heritage within the Commonwealth. Uh, this is a historical one. From the historical point of view, the Commonwealth is deeply linked to the heritage of the British Empire. And it represents not only the history of Great Britain, of the role and centrality of Great Britain, but uh, it represents also the great adventure of the conquest of men around uh, and towards environment and resources building infrastructures, building states, building interconnections, as Sir Robin Marsh explained in, its in, in his introduction in the first day, uh, with a positivistic faith in the future of the humankind, with a conceptualization of order society, a place for everything, we could say everything in its place. Um, to quote Sir Eric Hobsbawm, a great historian, uh, it represents also a trace of the great affirmation and triumph of the English and European bourgeois. But the story of the Commonwealth, on the other hand, is also the story of a great process of independence, of regulated organization, of liberty, of autonomy, of freedom, since we could say the Balfour Report of 1926, since the Westminster Charter of 1931, with a decisive acceleration after the Second World War, with the creation of a general secretary in 1965, and the recognition of the status of dominion and then of the member states. But from a historical point of view, we have to consider another uh, problematic in element, uh, especially the Western European historiography focalized the material basis of the Commonwealth, 
of the relationship between motherland and countries tied or member states. And this can be explained for two reasons, in my opinion. On the one hand, the fact that the European historiography has primarily focused on economic approach and aspects of social phenomena for the prevalent influence of historiographic, uh, of Marxist approach, till the 70s, we could say. But on the other hand, the hypothesis that the Commonwealth has been above all a historical reality based on a network of economic and commercial ties. But the Commonwealth has been, and still is today, a reality of profound reciprocal influences, interconnections, and cultural ascendancy. The fact itself, the member states uh, are joined by a common language, English, shows how the Commonwealth was born and initially supported by culture, by a cultural factor, such as language. Significantly, for example, the historiography developed in the last decades, uh, the so-called um, post-colonial studies approached and focused the problem of interconnections of raptors and ties also from a cultural point of view. But we could uh, also consider another element uh, more uh, freely. Let's consider the profound influence that English literature has experienced in its history from the ascendancies of countries tied to the empire and then uh, to the in, uh, Great Britain. Uh, above all, for example, in the Victorian era and the era of the anti-Victorian reaction. Let's make some examples just to confirm. For example, the novels written by Joseph Conrad, Heart of Darkness, 1899, set in a jungle. The Shadow Line, a confession, recounts the adventure of a youth who becomes captain on the eastern seas between Bangkok and Singapore. And for example, another author like Robert Louis Stevenson, uh, with tales and romances built on the memory of uh, the islands of the sea, uh, the South Sea. But also another example, uh, let's consider uh, Sherlock Holmes, perhaps the most famous character of English mystery literature. He lives in full all the influences and connections between Great Britain and her colonies. He's a great consumer of tobacco, of opium coming from the commerce with India, encounters Dr. John Watson in the laboratory of anatomy saying, I see you've been in Afghanistan, as the doctor was involved and injured in the second Anglo-Afghan war in 1880 and is also engaged in several cases involving revenge for distant torts. For example, The Devil's Foot, the story of a doctor who explored Africa and there discovered this tremendous poison, The Devil's Foot, the radix pedis doubly in Latin, or The Sign of the Four. The children of Major John Scholte live in a house full of Indian curiosities and treasure of the Orient, collected by the father during his service in the military army. For these reasons, the issue of cultural assets of the Commonwealth it is not easy, not easy to address, especially from the point of view of definition. To answer the question, do cultural assets of the Commonwealth exist, and if so, in what form, means considering not only this conceptualization institutionally recognized, especially by the UNESCO and the last uh, UNESCO conventions, in particular the 1972 Paris Convention, or the last about intangible cultural heritage, particularly important with regard to the uh, Commonwealth. But also, also, uh, more in general, the ties 
historically stratified on the level of reciprocal cultural influences. Seen from above, in my opinion, the Commonwealth could be said to represent one of the first great phenomena of globalization of culture in a double meaning of conquest and hegemony of the countries that were gradually annexed, but also, conversely, the conquest and penetration of cultural elements from the annexed countries towards the motherland. Let's make some examples. England brought to the conquered lands language, institutions, the parliament, uh, administrative structures, fashions and customs, and great mass phenomena, in particular politics, for example. Is it, mm, it's true, for example, that the governing classes in the former colonies, Gandhi is an example, studied and were educated in British-run schools or even directly in England. Uh, in England. Or, uh, for example, uh, one of the first labor federations to be founded in the world was the Federation of Australian Builders in 1856. And let us never forget sport, as Mark mentioned in, its, uh, in his introduction. Not so much football, I would say, but rugby. Uh, in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, becoming part of national identity. Everyone knows the famous haka of the All Blacks uh, with a captain, with a kilometer of tongue at the end of the, uh, of the, the, the haka. Uh, or, for example, cricket in India, Pakistan. But at the same time, the conquered countries penetrated England with their products, tea, silk, tobacco, opium, rum, and all that we see today in a city such as London, expression of globalization in a process which take place, takes place long ago. So to talk about cultural assets of the Commonwealth means talk about the specific relationship between English hegemony and specificity of the individual countries, verifying how much each nation has maintained its own characteristics under the guise of anglicization, and also means to examine what the Commonwealth has become today, and what has become of its patrimony of culture and tradition, and what role it can play today. Well, approaching this matter, it could be said that the construction of a cultural identity within the Commonwealth begins with the same affirmation of a culture of museums, of collections, of preservation, typical of the 19th, 20th centuries, when also Great Britain sees the emergence of a cultural sensibility connected to positivistic culture, the gathering of objects uh, considering worthy of preservation. Uh, the British Museum is perhaps the most famous example, but not the only one. Um, and we could also examine, with respect to the historical experience of protection proposed by Great Britain, characterized by some elements, and for example, a highly decentralized administration, a significant role of private associations, particularly evident in the case of National Trust, created in 1916, and an important role of municipalities, different approaches introduced in different countries, more or less liberal. We could uh, consider some, uh, lots of examples. For example, the law uh, introduced in 1878 in India, very liberal, or other laws introduced in other different countries, much less liberal. But given the aim of the subject, it's perhaps more interesting to see how the administration of cultural assets was organized in the aftermath of independence. Highlighting first of all how the problems of cultural assets are connected to the construction of a complex relationship between the traces of the colonial past and the definition of a national identity. Trying to identify a second phase of a hypothetical periodization after the colonial phase of independence and adhesion of the various countries to the Commonwealth, 
we can observe elements common among the various experiences of policy and legislation related to cultural assets, along with specificities that become more and more accentuated. These dynamics are evident from two points of view. That one of the content of the assets under protection and the type of action developed by the individual governments. In terms of contents, it's easy to see how the cultural assets of the member countries of the Commonwealth are marked by the recognition of diversity as a resource. Diversity linked to the stratification of European culture on top of indigenous culture and the multiple influences that over the course of centuries were consolidated and penetrated through migratory movements. Diversity is indicated as an element intrinsic to national identity, for example, in Canada, but also in many Caribbean countries. And taking a rapid look at a list of the assets and sites preserved and protected, gradually added to the inventory of cultural assets of each country. Or, for example, observing the system of museal organization, it appears evident how the preservation and protection were aimed in two main directions. One, of the crystallization of the colonial past as identity shaping memory, and the other, the consideration of the pre-colonial past. Unlike the situation in the South American states, which gradually obtained independence between the 19th and 20th centuries, where the colonial past was progressively submerged in favor of the rediscovery of an indigenous purity of the pre-Columbian past, in the states under English colonial administration, the cultural penetration of the motherland brought about the construction of that delicate and complex equilibrium between the British presence and the valorization of the specificities deriving from the previous epoch. This phenomenon is particularly evident in the case of intangible cultural assets. And we could consider, for example, the case of India, with uh, a series of festivals more than there are days on the calendar today. But for example, uh, a, a similar uh, reflection could be made about Caribbean countries or um, other countries. And of course, uh, without considering the complex issue of the diversity of cultural assets of the various countries of the vast African continent here so well represented. But the commonal references uh, that lead this diversity back to the Commonwealth are equally evident. To offer one example, in the Commonwealth countries, November 11 is celebrated as Armistice Day with a liturgical ritual in honor of the fallen of the Great War, certainly present in other European countries, France, Germany, but significantly uh, introduced by the King George V. And let's consider again the sport. The national rugby teams of the Commonwealth feature a puppy on the uniform, symbol of peace and of belonging to the Commonwealth. And again, speaking of sports, uh, consider that India entered the elite club of cricket playing countries in 1932. And the massive expansion of the game after independence makes it today the most popular sport of the country. Now, we have to consider, approaching the end of this reflection, Commonwealth uh, tried to introduce some rules to uh, regulate the interconnection uh, of uh, its uh, member states uh, with respect to the national legislation of each country. We could consider two examples. In Australia, during the 60s and 70s, a more nationalistic movement moved away from the traditional me meaning of cultural heritage and defined in a new perspective the meaning of cultural heritage. This meaning was defined linking it to the new conceptualization given by the World Heritage Convention of 1972, 
So Australia presents today three different levels of legislation, federal, state, and territory. And in this context, two lists have been created of heritage places. The national list of national heritage places and the Commonwealth list of Commonwealth heritage place. Another example, in India, the problem is very different as the relevance of the intangible cultural heritage. For example, the folklore or the uh, traditional manifestations. For example, uh, the Hindustani and Karnatak music or other we could consider uh, linked uh, to the urban stage of the development of India and no more linked to the concept of community. Because one of the problem emerging, considering the Commonwealth cultural heritage from the point of view of intangible cultural heritage in particular, is the fact uh, of defining the community and within it defining the different communities of Commonwealth, uh, particularly evident in each member states. The Commonwealth uh, has introduced some elements of regulation of relationships among members. And the most relevant is the framework of regulation for the return of valuable objects rediscovered in one country but belonging to another, approved in 1993 in Mauritius. In some cases, also more rigid frameworks and rules introduced to protect the assets of a single country, for example, it happened with the introduction of a list of protected assets in Australia in 2004, or still again, it uh, has been improved the organizational system of protection in Canada. But just to arrive uh, to a brief and problematic uh, conclusion or effort of conclusion, one, what then is the Commonwealth and what role uh, can it play today? Uh, in the completely changed uh, world we are living in. Well, apart from the various initiatives that the Secretary of the Commonwealth carries out to encourage exchange and trade among member states for promotion, for finance, the feature which is particularly striking about the Commonwealth is the power of an example, in my opinion at least, of global governance of culture, supported by the recognition of certain common elements of identity, but with full respect for diversity and national specificity. In this sense, the Commonwealth seems today to have become, above all, a sort of cultural sensibility, which nevertheless allows the various member countries to recognize a common trait which also gives strength to their national identity, but with respect to uh, their differences and different influences. So in this sense, in my opinion, the Commonwealth may be put uh, as an example of successful cultural diplomacy. It is a mixture of races, languages, religions, customs, habits, traditions. It offers a model for management of the complexity of the modern world. And I would say, just to conclude, especially for the Europe and also with respect to the relationship of Great Britain with Europe, in particular after the emergence of the matter of the Brexit. Thank you very much for your kind attention.
Yeah, thank you, uh, Professor Andrea Azul. Abuza, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is an excellent presentation. I really fascinated with it. Please, uh, on your own opinion, on what scale can you measure, you know, the aims and uh, objective of Commonwealth, you know, as uh, it was first outlined in uh, Singapore uh, Declaration of uh, 1971, you know, where the aim um, out um, you know, promoting uh, democracy, you know, fighting against racism, uh, poverty, diseases, and um, and um, all of that, you know, until uh, social activities, you know, within the member states. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for your very interesting remarks and your suggestions. Um, I'll recollect them, of course, uh, in the prosecution of my study, of my research. Um, this is true. Uh, this is a matter um, I, I, I try to answer uh, generally to both the, the questions. Um, it is a matter of freedom, uh, of autonomy, and of independence, of course, of fight against racism, of um, affirmation of rights, human rights in particular. But uh, what I um, pretended or uh, wanted to, to point out uh, was above all the relevance of uh, the reciprocal influences. Also, uh, in countries become independent and developed uh, with a particular independent system of regulations and of freedom, organization, and so on. But in my opinion, at least, uh, the great influence of, of uh, the Commonwealth as a trace of the presence the, uh, of great breathing in each country uh, can be uh, for, forgotten uh, and can be denied um, because I think um, it's in the mixture uh, of different uh, cultural influences that also the independence and the, the development uh, of different traditions and cultures can become more and more uh, strong every day. This is, of course, just my opinion. And, uh, yeah. Mauritius? Yeah, Mauritius was, um, the um, framework of Mauritius in 1993 uh, was um, uh, perhaps the first and more important, uh, more important uh, documented in the last case to try to regulate uh, rules of interconnections um, with the respect of independence, with uh, respect of different systems, but given some um, shared rules between different countries. So uh, I think perhaps uh, one of the most relevant in this uh, last part of activity of uh, the Commonwealth. But the anyway, regarding this issue is of Mauritius, they were supposed to hold the meeting, the meeting that's been held every two years. They refused to hold the session in Mauritius for human rights reasons. Yeah, that's true. Um, and in fact, I repeat, uh, this problem uh, is uh, perhaps the most relevant, uh, the problem of connections between the influence of the uh, former motherland and the independence and affirmation of human rights in each country. Um, well, this is a um, crucial matter you, you point out. Uh, of course, um, it's the object of a long debate, so um, I've just proposed some reflections about uh, this, uh, this matter. Because one of the countries had a rich record of human rights issues. 
Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. Any other thinkers? Oh. Thank you for your uh, great presentation. Um, if you are familiar with British Council policy or activities, I'd like to know uh, any significant role the British Council is playing in the strength and the identity with the Commonwealth. Well, um, really, I didn't focalize exactly the problem of the British Council. Anyway, British Council um, is today one of the most relevant agencies in the development of an action of cultural diplomacy and protection of cultural heritage, and uh, within, with respect to the countries of Commonwealth. So um, it is absolutely true what you, what you say. Um, British Council is, um, plays a, a, a very relevant role in the transmission and exchange of um, English culture uh, all over the world. And uh, like, for example, uh, each uh, institute of uh, foreign or national, ident uh, national culture abroad. For example, I'm Italian. Uh, it is equally relevant the role of the Instituto Italiano di Cultura uh, to offer an approach of knowledge to other countries or in other countries. For example, the role of the embassies, you work in an embassy and you know very well this matter, the role of an embassy in the development of a cultural diplomatic action is absolutely relevant, connected with this kind of different agencies. Uh, we can mention the British Council is one of these, very, very relevant, absolutely. <clears throat> can I say something? Uh, it's very, very good to hear what you have to say, very well research. Um, I was fascinated about sports. Because I love sport. Yeah, sport. <laughs> and, uh, but, um, but more importantly, I thought, since you've studied it much more than anyone here, maybe, um, would you say that it might be a good suggestion to get um, uh, to strengthen the position of, if you like, understanding of the motherland of the, of the uh, mm -hmm. whatever you call them, of the countries, Commonwealth nations? Uh, is to uh, maybe through regional groups to suggest maybe to the Commonwealth uh, Secretary to the regional groups and then the regions work together and then they they kind of make their recommendations. You know, otherwise it, it is up to the Secretary to do everything more or less, isn't it? Mm -hmm. You know, if, if they had the regional, let's say three, four, five countries work together mm -hmm. uh, about cooperation. That would be also a fantastic way to get like Africans to work together or Asians, wherever they are, to work together, North, North, North America and North America, and you see that uh, Australia to work together for some aim. Mm -hmm. you know? I mean, it's interesting. I don't know where this suggestion can come from, unless somebody's really studied and, you know, uh, you studied the, the case of the um, Commonwealth and the influence of British on the mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, um, I hope so. Um, yeah, I think um, the regional activity or the connections between um, countries close in a regional dimension is absolutely important. Um, yesterday, His Excellency the Ambassador of Cyprus mentioned this matter, speaking about a word more much more connected, but also much more fragmented. And it mentioned a national matter and also a regional matter. The development of the regional level of the institutional activity is absolutely relevant in this uh, new world. So um, in my opinion, of course, at least in my opinion, the uh, to strengthen these regional level of activity within the Commonwealth 
but also in Europe we'll speak about we'll speak about European identity. We have a great problem of regional identities within Europe. So uh, the development of uh, connected actions or connected um, programs, for example, the Euromed, the Euromed action, is it possible and how uh, to develop this uh, Euro, Euro Mediterranean area in its, uh, in its uh, institutional level, in its strength, economic basis, cultural, de cultural development, especially cultural development. We live around the Great Lake, to, to, to quote Fernand Brodel, uh, the Great Lake is a matter of identity, and we have to develop this uh, level of connection. So I think also uh, within the Commonwealth, it, it should be uh, absolutely uh, good um, to, to strengthen these, these uh, dimensions. Young, young people from uh, European achievers, they went to Euromed program in Italy, and they are amazing. Yeah, 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 for example. Multiplied tenfold in, in, in uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, on that note, I'd say let's express our sincere gratitude to Andrea for excellent presentation.